You're listening to The Ones Who Succeed on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your pods. I'm Campbell Barron, or at Campbell J. Barron on Instagram and Twitter. Welcome to the program. In the world of Silicon Valley, part of what makes a great venture capitalist is someone who could not only see and predict industry trends, but someone who could harness those insights and layer them on top of their industry assumptions and keen sense of products. Because having a venture investor is way more than just capital. A great venture investor will take the steps to optimize your company for success. And in the fast-moving competitive world of consumer technology, having an investor with strong product experience and intuition is invaluable. Josh Ellman, a former venture capitalist at Greylock, is one of Silicon Valley's top product builders. Having been an early employee at LinkedIn as their senior product manager, Josh developed his love for building and jamming on all things product as the professional social network blitzscaled during the boom that was Web 2.0. Josh then spent time at Facebook in 2008 managing Facebook's platform, which enabled developers around the world to build apps harnessing the social network. Then in 2009, Josh helped Twitter once again as a product manager surpass over 100 million monthly active users. All of this experience building and scaling products culminated into his position as general partner at Greylock, a premier Silicon Valley-based venture firm where Josh invested in companies including Musical.ly, which went on to become TikTok, House Party, Medium, Discord, and many others. Josh is now a board member at Greylock, supporting his investments while actively sitting on the board of Medium, Discord, and Mammoth Media. Josh, based in Silicon Valley, joined this program via Zoom. This is The Ones Who Succeed. I'm Campbell Barron. My conversation with Josh Josh Elman starts now. Josh, I really appreciate you taking the time to come on the program. Great to get to talk to you. Thanks for having me. So I'm really interested in the VC world and why I really wanted to have you on the program was not only your experience in the VC world, but I am really interested in the intersection uh, that you have in regards to venture investing and products, because it seems like at the center of your career is this experience building various products, whether that's Twitter, LinkedIn, Facebook, Robinhood, etc. And so I really want to get into that. But before I get into that, if you can introduce yourself, who are you and, and what do you do? Hi, my name is Josh Elman. I am had 23 years of experience building products in and around Silicon Valley. Um, a lot of it as a first as an engineer, then as a product manager, then as a venture capitalist, and then again as a, a you know running product. Uh, most recently at Robinhood, um, I left at the end of 2019, hoping that kind of 2020 was going to be sort of a, a break, refresher, a year full of travel. 2020 has certainly been a break. It has not been filled with travel. It has <laughs> been oddly refreshing not to have day-to-day things that I'm working on. I'm still on a couple boards and helping a bunch of companies as an advisor, but it's been you know, quite a strange year for all of us. Yeah, it's been quite a strange year indeed. And yeah, 2020 wouldn't be the year I would pick to travel. Let's just say that. Um, if only I had known. Yeah, exactly. If only, yeah, I would have bought Zoom stock. Um, so exactly. how did how did you develop your interest in technology? What's your origin story leading up to LinkedIn, leading up to your early days? Um, what were you like as a kid, and how did that? How did your technology interest kind of come to fruition? So we got my first computer when I was five years old. It was a VIC twenty, and my dad was really into computers. He had been a psychology major and psychology professor, but was always interested in how computers were changing things, and so. Got us this VIC-20, and you know I would hack around it a little bit, but mostly used it to play games. And like got really good at learning how to play games. We first loaded them off of cassette tapes. Mm-hmm. Then we had big floppy disk drives. Then we had the, the smaller disk drives. I got my first Macintosh, uh, which was like a little bit classic Macintosh. Uh, I don't remember if it was like 1986 or 1987. I got into desktop publishing. I was never really a programmer, although I did make some programs like back when I was like seven and eight. I even like once programmed a Super Bowl logger where I could like type in every play and then it printed out like an actual log because we didn't just get those on the internet anymore. Right, right, right. You'd never get like a full play log unless you bought these like expensive books. So I created my own program, but I kind of waned from programming. My brother really became the hardcore programmer and I just became a good computer user. But um, I said, I'm going to go go all in on building technology. And Stanford had a really good program that attracted me called Symbolic Systems. Um, It's a combination of linguistics, computer science, philosophy, and psychology. And so it kind of mixes how people think and how computers think. And because I knew I wasn't just a 
a true hardcore programmer, assembly language, you know, chip level stuff. I cared much more about what we built and how technology impacted people. I really loved that intersection. And I got to do a lot of focus on human computer interaction. So decided to pursue symbolic systems and, and jumped in and, and turned out to really love it. But when I finished college, I knew I didn't just want to be a programmer the rest of my career. I knew I really wanted to go help design and conceive of products. And so I had done a couple of internships. I had interned at Microsoft, which was the giant Google, Apple, Facebook at the time. Microsoft was as big and as central to the industry as like all three of them combined right now. Yeah, yeah. It was the behemoth. 1995, the summer of Windows 95, huge culminating moment. So I interned there. And then the next year, I interned at a 10-person startup. Um, At the time, it was called Kartoffelsoft and eventually became called Homestead.com. And then they sold it into it about 10 years after I had in, interned with them. And I kind of saw this contrast of the small startup that was trying to find its way and get off the ground and become worth something and the giant company. And I was like, I want David something. David and Goliath. Yeah, David yeah. and Goliath. I was like, I want something that's a little bit farther along than the tiny startup that has a mission and a chance to change the world, but isn't necessarily Microsoft size. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. so I, I also want to go back up to Seattle. So I found this company, Real Networks. And I ended up convincing them to hire me as a, a junior programmer. So that was kind of the, the origin story that got me through my first job. And then, yeah. and then you know, I can, you know. We'll talk about uh, LinkedIn and et cetera. But my, my question is, it sounds like you really just had this natural interest in products. What was it about building things? And, and it didn't necessarily sound like it was the writing code that excited you, but the kind of result and the design. So what was it that attracted you to just the idea of building products and then seeing it in the hands of users? Yeah, that's a really, really insightful way to put it and a great question. What got me is I've always been interested in how people think and how social groups think and how dynamics work and how, Mm -hmm. you know, I don't want to say that I was like in the middle of social circles because I was always kind of awkward and kind of nerdy, but, but I was always paying attention and I understood how all the dynamics worked and how people interacted and what they interacted with. And I loved studying that. And I loved thinking about what things can change that and what products can change that. And I love that joy of trying something new and realizing how much of an impact this can actually have in your life. And so I was always just thinking about problems and thinking about products and thinking about things that would get into people's hands and make their lives Mm -hmm. different. And so, as I said, like, it even took me this path of like thinking I was just going to do business to realizing, wait, I can actually go make this stuff. And it's so much more fun and engaging. Mm -hmm. Um, But once I did that, there has been no going back. Yeah, no, that's that's very insightful. And it seems like you kind of uh, fulfilled that mission. You spent time at LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, Robinhood, and worked with startups through Greylock as a VC. And I really want to highlight the Twitter, Facebook, and LinkedIn experiences, because those were all pretty close together. And you kind of were involved with pretty much all of those companies towards the earlier end. I know Facebook was 2009, but you know LinkedIn was like, I'm pretty sure you joined in 2004, if I'm correct. So yep. talk about the LinkedIn experience, because it seems like that was another pivotal moment in your career and kind of what you learned about products and yourself while at LinkedIn. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Was. So, so I'll give you just a little bit of preamble to get to LinkedIn, because how I got there is, is interesting. Yeah, for sure. Well. Um, so we're talking about real networks. By 2003, it was clear to me that Real Networks, as amazing as the opportunity was, was not going to be the company that was going to put audio, video on everybody's computers for the next 10 years. Apple had come out with iTunes, the iPod, and Real was sort of getting hit by Microsoft making everything free. And Real made a ton of decisions that were very user unfriendly. I remember going into some meetings and like arguing for the user and being shown spreadsheets that would show how we'd make more money if we did something that I thought was, was anti-user. And I didn't mm-hmm. have any language to argue with those. Right. And I thought in my head, wow, even being an engineer to build things isn't meaningful enough because I'm missing this whole other language. And I thought I needed to go to business school to learn this language of business. And my wife, um, who, who had been with me since Stanford, um, decided that like, we were kind of ready to move out of Seattle. She had grown up in the Bay Area, wanted to come back to the Bay Area. And so we went on a sabbatical, a four-month trip. I came back to my job and I was like, this is like Groundhog Day. Like I never left. Like 
maybe it is time for a change. She was like, let's go to the Bay Area. And so I decided to apply to business school at the very last minute. And so we moved down to the Valley and I started business school and social networking starts heating up. And I'm debating with a bunch of my friends. We even did this point counterpoint in the little Berkeley business school newspaper. They used to print a a newspaper every week about social networking and how big it was going to get. And Mm -hmm. And I think I had to take the, the con side because we were both pro. But um, I really believed that social networking is big. And I was like, maybe I could go help them while I'm still in business school because I got to get this MBA and learn this business language. And I learned a lot in my first semester. And, and I wrote to LinkedIn and Friendster that was the other big social network at the time. Friendster never applied to me, but LinkedIn did. And mm-hmm. at LinkedIn, uh, Reed Hoffman, who's the founder, had done the same yeah. program, symbolic systems program as me at Stanford as did the CTO, a guy named Eric Lee, but I joined as kind of the first product manager hire and got to learn so much. And Mm -hmm. with LinkedIn, if you needed to get a job before LinkedIn, man, it was hard. You would ask, you would either put your resume up at a job site, apply for a bunch of stuff just with resume spam, or you would go and like find a friend and go, do you know anybody at this company? You know, you'd ask after like a long lunch and then they go, no, I don't really know anybody. You'd be like, crap. And then you'd like find your next friend. Do you right. know anybody in this company? And like after yeah. a long lunch, go down the tree and, yeah. and just go through the tree. And LinkedIn was like, just put it all online. Your connect, your connections there, your Rolodex is there. And it was amazing. You know, I got to work on all the early growth, all the viral loops. And like, we really focused on just growing the network. So kind of launched the very first job board, started going to a bunch of HR conferences and meeting recruiters. And that's when my ADD hit. And that's when I said, gosh, I like LinkedIn, but I'm not really interested in the future of HR and recruiting. And gosh, I've already vested some stock here. And, you know, maybe I should go work somewhere else that's like more fun and, and met this company called Zazzle that was another Stanford set of Stanford founders a few years um, after me. And they believed that they could put all creativity online. And so yeah. that pulled me into Zazzle over LinkedIn. I spent a couple of years there. I helped build up the product team and, you know, we grew the, the team and the revenue and they're still around doing, doing incredibly well, actually. It's kind of one of these like, you know, 15 years later, sort of not really talked about anymore, but it's just like, you know, quietly doing quite well. And I worked there for a couple of years and then I got my ADD again where I was like, oh, this is never going to be as big as I want it to be. Uh, yeah. Social still is taking off. The Facebook platform had just launched right. and I knew a bunch of people there and I was like, I was like, I would love to go work on that. And Facebook at the time was, you know, maybe 500 people. So it was, you know, I can't say it was as small as LinkedIn when I joined, but you know. Pretty small still compared to what it is now. Relative to now. I mean, I go back now and it's like, you know, there's a few faces I still know. And then it's just like this mammoth company. Um, Yeah. But uh, the platform had launched and, you know, this was 2007. So for a lot of people and your listeners, this might still feel like ancient history, but for me, I lived it. You know, the Facebook platform was the first way that if you're building a consumer internet product, you could get massive distribution almost overnight. Because yeah, by harnessing could, the Facebook social platform. Yeah, by harnessing the Facebook social graph, by harnessing the Facebook news feed. And so what happened was a lot of entrepreneurs got really excited and built things on top of Facebook platform. Yeah. And they built yeah. new apps that were viral. You might have never heard of them, but they were things called like Super Pope that was like, a much more fun animated Pope. There was... Yeah. Wasn't Dave Morin leading this? Yeah. So Dave yeah. Morin was one of the early advocates. He, uh, we worked side by side. He's, he, yeah. he was phenomenal. He helped get that platform off the ground. And when I came in, the vision mm-hmm. was like, okay, it's great we have all these startups building things, but why don't we have the rest of the internet? Why is Amazon not building things on Facebook platform? Why is CNN right. not? And they were like, look, we want everything at our own website. And so we were like, how do we bring the social graph to your websites? How do we make Facebook the ecosystem where you depend on Facebook for your identity and your friends and maybe sharing what you're doing through the feed, but then the social power you know, comes to every other website. We had visions like mm-hmm. when you go to Yelp, you should see reviews from your friends. When you go to CNN, you should see articles your friends like. When you go to Amazon, you should see things your friends are buying or reviewing or wanting so that you can make all that work. And mm-hmm. so... So I got to join and help lead that effort. We called it Facebook Connect at the time. It's now just Facebook Login. But this was the whole login with Facebook, bring your graph to the other websites, and it was incredible. 
Yeah. Now I have to ask you about this uh, before we move on to Twitter, um, because Facebook was really just like a darling pretty much up until 2016 and, and definitely idolized and accomplished some, some serious growth. But how do you see Facebook in 2009 versus Facebook in 2020? And you don't work at Facebook now, so it's not as easy to compare, but I, I'm sure you still know a couple people who are there. How has the company evolved? So I think there's a really interesting phenomenon that was happening back then, which I'd call as naively optimistic. Like we truly believe that the internet had been sort of a place of anonymity and that by bringing identity, your real face, your real friends along with you on your internet journeys, your online journeys would make that as fun, social, engaging as the offline world. You know, I used to say like, you know, again, you were closer to the people you were with on Facebook because even though you weren't with them, you knew what was going on in their lives. You know, when you mm -hmm. worked at Facebook, for example, you'd come back on a Monday morning and see your people in the office. Instead of ever saying, how was your weekend? You would jump into like, oh my gosh, was that concert as good as the pictures looked? Or, oh, mm -hmm. I'm really sorry you fell off your bike. I hope you're doing well. You know, right. and, and you would just immediately could jump forward in, yeah. in the interview. There's this enhanced sense of empathy that you kind of yeah. wouldn't be able to see through beforehand. No, totally. And, and so we, we just really believe that like, that's the power of bringing Facebook to the world. And I, look, when we talked about Facebook Connect and connecting with these other websites and bringing your friends along and sharing, quote, your data with that website, we believe that this was actually a win-win, a win for the website, a win for you, a better experience. You know, we didn't believe that people were going to just like click and like, oh, I'll just give my data to anybody. And then somebody was going to like suck up all this data and do it. Now, I don't say we didn't like ever go, oh, I wonder if that will happen. But we certainly kind of were so optimistic that this was good for the world that we didn't even predict all of some of the, the negative backlash and negative implications. That right. Happened. You know, I think right. on the other hand, we should talk about like, imagine someday when everybody's on Facebook and people really use it in this way and they share things then you know the whole world's connected oh my gosh 100 million oh wait 500 million people oh could you imagine it being a billion a billion people on facebook and like these were like like dreams and wishes and like like desires but certainly not reality fast forward to 2020 and like look facebook really has achieved that mission like yeah. everybody's on it everybody's connected there's a lot of value that comes from all those connections. But by bringing the whole world on, we haven't just brought the good parts of the world. We've brought the world's problems too. And so right. I think the people, the company right now sort of treat it very differently. There's no longer this naive optimism. There's now a very pragmatic realism that is like, hey, we do good for the world, but we also have a lot of bad for the world that's reflected that we want to see how much of that we can help blunt, limit, remove. You know, and, and, you know, we can't only, you mm -hmm. know, we can't prevent bad people from doing bad things, but we can certainly try to limit the, the impact that they have on other people. We yeah. think that, like, hey, by bringing people together, we'll have healthier conversations. Sometimes bringing people together leads to unhealthy conversations. Sometimes mm -hmm. people share things to inflame rather than to inform. And so I think the company, the people there now still believe in the mission, still believe in the opportunity that Facebook has to make the world better but also realize how much more can, damage can be inflicted and how much more seriously they need to take that than sort of the naive optimism. This won't really happen. This won't matter as much that I think was there right. much earlier. Right. I mean, I think, I think the number one thing you highlighted there is the naive optimism. And, you know, you read tech headlines these days that are much more critical of Facebook. And I'm sure you uh, have talked to many entrepreneurs and, and worked with them. That's not the starting point. And as a result, when you find immense product market fit, it's their products start being used for negative things um, in, in negative ways. And so I think it's kind of how you collect yourself and, and deal with the challenges and hurdles you faced afterwards. But my question is, when designing products, websites, apps, etc., it seems like there's the mission is to try to find product market fit, get people on your service, keep them on your service. Essentially, the idea of like a sticky product, optimizing for retention, etc. And do you think that there is an inherent negative side in regards to prioritizing the stickiness of a product, especially in the social space? That's a great question. You know, I would say that 
most people I've ever met in this industry are have very good intentions and truly believe that their products to make the world better. There have been a few grifters, and some have been even successful, who have found ways to take advantage of others and take advantage of the system. So I don't want to say that everybody's been great, but but certainly the vast majority. I think the challenge is that when you're trying to build something new, you truly believe that if people use it, their lives will be somewhat better. It doesn't mean wholly better, and it doesn't mean there will be trade-offs, but you truly do believe that that you're doing it. If you're building a game, you believe that, look, people are getting this moment of joy and levity and you know expression and interaction by playing this game. If you're building a social product, you believe that you're building moments of connectedness that they aren't having otherwise. Mm-hmm. If you're building a media product, you believe the people you're giving people access to either information or entertainment that they otherwise wouldn't, ha- you know, wouldn't have. I mean, Netflix right. gives me a ton of great information and a ton of great entertainment. And, and I love Netflix for that. You could also say that Netflix is addictive. I think the challenge that we found is, is when we're all building up these products, you know, and, and, you know, the market and the economy is sort of a thirst for growth. You have to give people over some threshold where they bring it into their lives on a repeated basis. And like your product isn't successful until somebody has incorporated it into their life's routines. And it takes, you know, sometimes it takes nudging. Sometimes it takes reminders. It's not like the first time you try something, you're like, awesome. I'm going to immediately use it every day. I mean, if you, if you have children or when you do, you'll realize that like most things we even take for granted now, washing your hands, brushing your teeth, like that takes nagging and reminding and nudging to, to make a habit too. And I mean, yeah, there's still, yeah. You know, informational campaigns, brush your teeth there twice a day to, to stay yeah. healthy, like whatever. Yeah. So, so you yeah. know, those are like public health campaigns. So, so products have learned that like it takes that to get somebody into that habit. I think mm-hmm. the big question is once somebody is now into a good habitual state with the product, how much more should you be doing to get them to do more versus how much should you now be doing to say, stay at a healthy habit? And I mm-hmm. think that we are just... The past three years have certainly opened up, I think, the, the company's eyes to like, you're not just startups anymore, thirsting for the next growth, thirsting for the next growth. But it's really only been the past, let's call it three years or so, where profits lock in, like where it's really felt there. And I think mm-hmm. now companies have a bigger responsibility to go, now that you're in habit, now what should I actually do to help you stay there but stay healthy? And you're seeing Mm -hmm. things like screen time and like, hey, you're done with your feed. And so I think we're just starting to see that. But look, like every industry now has that challenge. You know, food is great until you eat too much. So so we all have responsibility. And that's where the companies need to self-regulate or the regulators will. I really want to talk about your uh, your takes kind of on on products, especially in, in 2020. And and you spent quite a, a, a short period of time, but a decent period of time at Robinhood managing that product. And Robinhood is a startup that has been doing really, really well during during this pandemic and has also faced some, you know, harsh headlines as a result. And there's this like very, very complicated media versus technology debate that's quite frankly could be its own podcast episode. And so I don't really want to get too much into that. However, you know, you can't ignore it in regards to talking about products and especially where Robin Hood is right now. What is your stance on Robin Hood? How do you look at the challenges uh, they've faced, speaking on behalf of yourself? And then how do you look at the relationship with the media? So I think there's two parts here. You know, this goes very hand in hand with sort of the naive optimism and the responsibility we've been talking about with, with Facebook and other things right. too. Look, right. Five, six years ago when, when the founders were first starting Robin Hood, and even a couple of years ago when I joined the company, two and a half years ago, like getting people to make their first investment, like that's really powerful. That's good for the world. If you look at the economy, the, the, the best thing you could have done with money over the past decade was have it in the stock market as the whole economy grew and as everything grew. And what's, what's incredible and what's really disappointing is how imbalanced that, that is. The rich got richer, core job wages mm-hmm. didn't go up nearly as much as, as wealth through markets and investing. And flipping the table so that it's easy for everyone to invest. There aren't minimums. There aren't complicated products that make it feel like this isn't for you. There aren't the same commission trade, whether you're trading, you know, one share of a stock or a hundred shares of a stock, because it's really onerous when you're only trying to buy one share of stock. 
just to get started in the market. If you're 22 and you're making more than you're spending and you have enough emergency savings and you can afford to put some in the market, it can be great to do that. And it can be great to put some into index funds that are safe and stable. And it'd be great to have some theories of the world based on your expertise, where what brands you're buying, what experiences or things you're spending money on to make very specific investments based on your theories of the world too. And so that's mm-hmm. where I think Robinhood stands for is, hey, can we help people do that? Can we help you get in the market? Um, mm-hmm. So that's really powerful. On the other side, like some people go, hey, the markets move up and down every day. And if I move money in and out of the markets along this, I might be able to make a bunch of money. And there's a much, the, the group I talked about first, just getting money into the markets, their theories of the world, that's much, much bigger than this other population. But the other population is is noisy and does exist. It's loud. And they're like, yeah. whoa, I want to like swing trade on the market. And Robinhood is a great tool for that. And whoa, I put some money into the market. And whoa, I've already made some money. This looks easy. Let me try to do it more and let me keep going. And so you kind of have these, these two things going on that say, hey, wait a sec, like that becomes maybe less healthy or less sort of always thoughtful thinking about theories of the world mm-hmm. behavior and more trying to trade the markets. And right. for, every, for not everybody, like that, that's a good decision, either financially or with their time or their energy. You know, there have been stories even of people who are taking out debt in order to do this. That just sounds like a terrible idea. Like a, yeah. a second mortgage on your home or credit card loans to try to play to the market is yeah, a, that's a disaster. Yeah. Nobody yeah. should ever do that. And so, so then you go, okay, wait, like Robin Hood's so good about getting everyone into the markets. Like, is it good that some people do this? How much of it is a personal choice? There are a whole, now, unlike social media that was never regulated really before, like there's a whole bunch of financial regulations. Like the, mm-hmm. the SEC has a ton of great rules intended to pr- protect retail investors. Robin Hood follows those to like, you know, to the nines, yeah. like really believes in like, hey, like, day trading, like there's all kinds of rules about how many day trades you can make if you don't have that much money in the brokerage. And like, those are all very much like, you know, uh, expressed through the product because it's really important to follow those regulations. Mm -hmm. Now, the question is, is Robin, like, should there be more regulations? And like, I'll defer that to much smarter minds, but I really think it's important to, to be about democratizing finance in a way to let people do this in a way that's that's fully regulated and protected by what the SEC believes are the most important regulations. And I think Robinhood has done a, a, a very good job of doing that. Also, the media says, whoa, this day trading stuff is happening. There's a lot of people doing crazy things. Hey, Robinhood is sort of the poster child for this. Let's write mm-hmm. stories to show how Robinhood is like the reason that people are doing bad behaviors. And you know, mm-hmm. I never kind of believe that the that, that the product is why they're doing bad behaviors, but I certainly understand the the you know setting them up on the pedestal. They're reaping a lot of the rewards of people who are who are participating in the market right now. You know, mm-hmm. as new people are opening accounts, they're choosing Robinhood. As they're trading, they're choosing Robinhood to make their trades. And so mm-hmm. the media likes to make sort of examples of companies and say how much responsibility should they take? How much more than what the regulations already offer? You know, where are the lines here? You know, mm-hmm. hey. Is Robinhood really following all the regulations? And I think these are great questions to ask. You know, I I find that the media tech has become somewhat antagonistic because, you know, you got to have somebody to blame for bad things happening. You know, I look at the media and I'm saying like, stop telling stories about people making money day trading. But like, you know, it all sort of falls to, look at the end of the day, these are great questions to ask. And as product yeah. builders, you have a responsibility and the best thing you can do is keep building, make the product better, make the product safer, and you know understand the landscape that we're in. Coming up, my conversation with Josh Elman continues. The Ones Who Succeed will be right back after a brief word from our sponsor. This episode of The Ones Who Succeed is brought to you by Skillshare. Skillshare is an online learning platform with thousands of classes in business, marketing, technology, design, and more. You can take classes in social media marketing, video editing, entrepreneurship, you name it, they've got it. So whether you're trying to deepen your professional skill set, start a side hustle, or just explore a new passion, Skillshare is there to keep you learning and thriving. 
So ladies and gentlemen, here is the call to action. Skillshare is offering the ones who succeed listeners two months of unlimited access to thousands of classes all for free. To sign up, go to skillshare.com slash succeed. Again, that's skillshare.com slash succeed. That link is how they know the ones who succeed sent you to start your first two months now. You can find that link in the description of this podcast, and it would be awesome if you can support our show by supporting our sponsors. So one last time, visit skillshare.com slash succeed to start your first two months of Skillshare Premium today. And thanks to Skillshare for sponsoring the show. You're listening to The Ones Who Succeed. I'm Campbell Barron. Welcome back to the program. Thanks for joining me. So I'm about halfway through my conversation with Josh Elman, so we're going to jump right back into that. How do you look at the relationship, the complicated relationship in the recent years that tech journalists have, or journalists in general have, with Silicon Valley? It seems like it's deteriorated dramatically in the past few years, just much more critical. And do you think that's just? Do you think it's completely blown out of proportion. And I'm just curious, because as someone who's in Silicon Valley in that space, uh, you kind of see this firsthand with companies you work with, with companies you've been involved with. What are your thoughts? You know, I think the thing that we, we always forget is the power of a good narrative. And narratives are really, really important. And they, they are how we spread stories. As humans, we are just great storytellers. There's this amazing Tim Urban post from a few years ago, Hopefully we can find it later. It's about how ideas spread and how language forms and how we really kind of, you know, uh, it's about artificial intelligence, but it's about sort of how our entire brains have been about these stories and things that we're able to pass on from generation to generation that started with a don't eat that plant, it's poisonous, that person died, you know, and it like, you know, goes from there. And, And so narratives propel us. And look, the media, the broad media that we have are amazing storytellers and they are great at both creating narratives or, or weaving together the narratives that was happening now. And that really does set the agenda for a lot of people. Now we've ended mm-hmm. up with a couple of different factions. We've had sort of more, you know, you know, we've almost broken into like, I hate using words like left and right, but it feels like that sometimes where we yeah, have some, very yeah, much. You know, they're telling the same story from two different sides. And, and I kind of hate that because we're not getting to sort of what used to be the core story, but it, narrative is important. If you're a media company, narrative is what drives your business. You know, if you're building a product, like you want people to tell your story, it helps amplify it. I mean, look, when, when startups are on the way up, we're democratizing finance, we're opening communication and, and giving tools to everybody to, to create and share. We're, you know, this open information ecosystem that Twitter was, we are helping people connect in the place to talk that Discord is. We are the place for creativity that TikTok is. Like the media amplifies those stories and it's really, really powerful. And yet, look, when bad things are happening, the media amplifies those stories too. And they say, hey, these are villains. Hey, they are allowing good things to happen, but they're not taking enough care for all these bad things that are happening. Mm -hmm. And I just think we've gotten into a place where both are true and, and it's important to have the media be the, the people who kind of ask those questions. I think it's gotten a little bit antagonistic now because it's like every story is like, what's the angle? Who are you going to try to tear down? Hey, you know, if you're a media person who gets a great tear down story, you can actually, you know, find the real truth. Theranos though is a great example of a story. If you've read bad blood, like loved it, it's a story that truly did deserve to be torn down. Like it truly became a company that was not doing what's in the best interest of customers, naively optimistic or not, it like clearly was like the antithesis of that by the end, yeah. it felt like. Yeah. And, and oh, yeah. so, you know, there's a lot of suspicion and these companies have now won, like they run the world, like they have a responsibility. That's kind of how I think about it. I don't know if I've actually said anything valuable. No, you have. Yeah. I, I really appreciate Art. you sharing your insights. And I, I, I definitely think it's, especially you being involved with all these companies, it's, it's really interesting to hear. And enough with this, with this kind of grim, grim talk. Uh, I really want to hear about your story as a venture investor. You were a partner at Greylock. You still are. You're a board partner. So you sit on the boards of companies you you supported at Greylock. How did you become a VC? And then I have a bunch of questions about some of the startups you invested because uh, they're doing quite well now. 
So, uh, so uh, after Facebook, I was working on the platform stuff, but I wasn't quite building products. And I got to know the folks at Twitter over six months and decided to join them. And it was about 80 people in the company when I joined. And I got to start this team that we were going to focus on onboarding and user growth and get more people onto Twitter. And Twitter had a lot of people signing up, but going, what the hell do I do here? And so we, we tried to make it simpler and streamline stuff. And it was an amazing experience. And then about two years in, you know, they had fired Evan Williams, who was a CEO when I joined. There's this great book called Hatching Twitter that tells a story that I lived of, of Twitter. Dick Costello took over as CEO. Jack Dorsey came back back then to start kind of helping be more involved in the product strategy. He had not been involved at all when I first joined the company. And we didn't click. And a few months after he joined, I got fired. This was the summer of 2011. And I was like, oh my God, I'm no longer at LinkedIn or Facebook or Twitter. I've gotten to see the insides of all of them. You know, Do I need to go find another company? Or maybe I've done a better job finding early stage startups than actually staying with them. <laughs> oh my God, that's so true. I didn't even think about some that. Through my own ADD, some through other <laughs> oh things. Oh my God. And so, so I thought, I want to try being a VC. Now, I was really fortunate, two things. One is I had actually been at three very important companies at crucial times. So I had a lot of unique experience that I thought could be valuable to new entrepreneurs, especially mm -hmm. on growth, especially on how to use things like Facebook's platform. And I had the fortune of having known the Greylock team for a long time. And even Reed Hoffman, who had been the, the founder and CEO at LinkedIn when I was there, yeah. is now one of the, the lead partners at Greylock. So right. they said so an entry point. So, so they, they, you know, and, and so like very privileged, very fortunate that like my Stanford connection got me to LinkedIn, that then that connection got me to Greylock. So, you know, these are, you know, there's never any perfect pattern, but I was very, very fortunate. But I said, look, like they said, come hang out with us for a couple of years. You'll help us do investments. And if it really works out, you know, maybe you can stay and, and, and do investments too. And so, you know, I kind of thought it was going to be a two to three year job. And I was going to go back. The person who just rejoined actually as a partner at Greylock had just left after two or three years in a very similar role. But within a couple of years, I was just hunting for everything in the mobile internet social world. I, I almost did a deal with Snapchat. It fell apart the last minute. But oh, that, was no. like, you know, that was super early. I, I got to know, you know, the, the team there back then and, you know, I still stayed in touch. Man, they've done great. And I was I got to say I was right. But but we didn't quite do that investment. But then Evan Williams, who'd been the CEO at Twitter, started fundraising for Medium, and we got a chance to invest in that because I had such a good relationship with him. So yeah. we led that Series A. And then I was like, you know what? I'm going to stick with this venture thing. And they said, hey, stick, and you can start to kind of lead deals as a partner. And and you know, so over the next you know uh, six or seven years, that's what I've been. That's what I was doing, and got to really see the kind of future of the social world and the social landscape. Yeah. I mean, your time at Greylock was quite transformative just in terms of the companies you funded. You funded Musical.ly and, and, and House Party and even oversaw the, the whole medium funding cycle in the early days. But what was your investment thesis at Greylock at that time? I mean, look, my investment thesis was basically that like these phones are here. There are now going to be billions of them in the world and we're all going to need new tools to interact and connect. And Facebook and Twitter are going to be relevant, but there's going to be a whole bunch of other use cases by which we need to connect. Mm -hmm. And we're going to need to connect to hardware in new ways. And we're going to need to connect to services in new ways. And so I basically spent all of my time looking for products that kind of help people connect in some fashion. Again, whether mm -hmm. it was like, so my very first investment was one called Smart Things that we sold to Samsung. It's now the center of their sort mm -hmm. of IoT strategy. And that was about connecting people to devices and connecting devices to each other in their homes. You know, and, uh, you know, I later invested in Discord, believing that like gamers right. needed Discord, new tools yeah. to connect. And if, if we got that right, that was like gaming was very early for them. If we got that right. Then like, hey, over time, Discord could build this powerful tool for lots and lots of people to connect. And that, that I hope will be one of my most successful investments because they're just yeah. doing great. Discord's you know, killing it. Yeah. When I found... Musically, they were a team in, in Shanghai that felt like a U.S. Silicon Valley team building a product for kids to be more creative with their phones and for like, you know, for, for teens and, and young adults. And they were creating this amazing content that was just spectacular. And I yeah. was like, whoa, I mean, I invested in that in like a week because, you know, as soon as I met the team and felt their vision, I just knew that there was going to be something there. Uh, and so mm -hmm. my whole thesis was find these things that help people connect to experiences or each other or, you know, some hardware or businesses and be able to do that. And, and it was, it was a great run. And I'm like 
super proud. I think, uh, you know, House Party, which sold the Fort, you know, yeah. Epic, Epic Games, Makers of Fortnite a couple of years ago. They're still doing really well. Smart Things is still doing really well. Medium's doing quite well. You know, I talked about Discord and Musical.ly has become TikTok and it's a whole new yeah. phenomenon. And, and it's oh, yeah. all been about sort of continuing to find these ways that people can connect. Mm -hmm. Part of the reason I really wanted to have you on the program was to talk about this blog post you wrote. The next great platform is the one that we already have. Yeah. Awesome title. And, and as someone who's been really interested in looking for the next great platform, I've had people on the program who think it's going to be voice and Alexa and drones or AR, VR, etc. But it is really interesting your take on kind of taking a step back and seeing the web 2.0 boom when everyone thought kind of the dot-com era was over. And I guess I may have done it already. But can you, in your words, briefly summarize the next great platform is the one we already have and it was written in 2016 while you were at Greylock does it still apply today in 2020 it does and it's it, I think it does and it's actually part of the reason that I'm not investing currently and thought about going back to operating and and I'm kind of figuring out what I really want to do I've been very fortunate in my 23 year career to go from having you know 1995 when I was in college there's about 15 million people who use it a connected internet device every day you know, outside of working hours. In the past hour, I'll bet you there were 3 billion people who use a connected internet device yeah. in some fashion or form, at least. That transformation is staggering. And in doing that, we have built the companies and the infrastructure and the tools that allow us to access information, each other, you know, services like ordering a car, services like ordering groceries, um, all directly through our connected devices. I mean, this COVID time has been just awful for so many reasons in the world, but it's amazing how much the internet has allowed us to connect oh, over yeah. podcasting, video, our work, sharing sharing work things, getting everything yeah. delivered to our home. And you know, there's still workers and everybody who we're so thankful for who are doing things like deliveries and, and shopping and whatnot. But for most people, the internet has allowed that transformation. And, mm -hmm. and I think we're there. And so then everybody's like, well, there was a platform shift from desktop to mobile. And I'm like, no, there was really an expansion. We used our desktop computer, but the rest of the time we were not connected. Now with mobile, we are. And mm -hmm. so it wasn't that we, we shifted from desktop to mobile, although some things we certainly did, but, but we filled in all this other time that's connected. And what I say yeah. now is like, it's mostly filled in now. The big products are here. The services are here. Like... If you're inventing something new, you're either doing it in the cracks that aren't filled or, you know, you're now listening to your, you know, internet radio or podcast as opposed to car radio. But like right. we're kind of at the edges of even filling the computing time. So there isn't going to be the same kind of shift. And I think now the big companies that serve billions of people are in a much better position to guide us to the next things than the startups, where in the past it was always the startups. And I liken this to Detroit in the 19, 1910s. If we were there in the 1910s, Every one of our friends and neighbors was working on some car company startup. I got a new axle. I got a new carburetor. I figured out a new way to like replace windshields. I figured out like whatever it is, like windshield wipers, like whatever it is, like everybody was figuring something out. And by the 1930s, it was consolidated into three, you know, GM, Ford and Chrysler that were the three primary car companies that guided us for most of the last century. And, and I, there's a big part of me that feels like we're there in tech. That doesn't mean there won't be innovation. Of course there will. That doesn't mean there won't be new startups. Of course, that will be very successful. Of course there will. But it might not mean that there's another 10 or $100 billion company that comes out of the same types of things of what we've already seen. And right. that's sort of and, my belief. Yeah. So I guess I got mixed messages from that last response. And my follow-up question is, do you still see, I want to get to kind of what you're excited about next, but you took a step back from, from Greylock and you were investing in like consumer social apps, uh, mainly at, at, at Greylock. Do you still think there's an opportunity to build interesting consumer social apps on the app store? Or are you looking for kind of what's next in terms of new, new potential platforms? So two things. One is a lot of the great apps that got built over the past decade were things that got very, very, very broad reach and then would monetize mm -hmm. with things like advertising once they got to all of that reach. I think right. that era and opportunity is much harder now. However, right. I do think that people are more willing to pay for experiences that matter to them. So building very mm -hmm. big businesses that allow you to, to experience something in a different way, I think is, is 
back and is much more relevant. And so I think the opportunity is really think about like, how do you build a unique business model? Discord, for example, is not about advertising. People pay for its premium subscription to have access to mm-hmm. features and boosting and boosting their servers. And I think right, we're right. going to see a lot more people building creative businesses that look like that rather than the social, get really big and then we'll monetize later. Um, right, that's, right. That's one thing. The second one, though, is I do think it's harder for me to envision the next $100 billion company coming out of the social or mobile ecosystem in the same way that all the last ones did. Because right. I think a lot of those really big opportunities are, are either somewhat filled or the big companies will race to get most of the market cap value creation. Mm-hmm. Right, if they right. see some great startup that does something, it's much easier to add that to their platform and get most of the value creation that comes of that, even if the startup gets full credit for pioneering it, inventing it, getting it un- mm-hmm. into the mm-hmm. mainstream. Even Stories is a great example where, where Snapchat certainly pioneered it and is very big in and of itself, but Instagram managed to popularize it and sort of bring it to a whole new level and is getting you know a right. ton of value from the way that advertisers' ads appear in Stories and everything else. And so that's kind of my theory that like when we're like, oh, it'll be AR. Well, like AR will get a lot of value from the big companies and how they use AR. The places that I'm excited for the really big opportunities, fintech is still going to yield a lot because the whole banking you know, ecosystem still has a ton of work. Crypto, you've seen that happen. Health, mm-hmm. you know, our information about our bodies and like even this, this awful disease that's going around right now, it just shows you how primitive and how limited right. we are in our understanding. You know, genomics is a massive change. These aren't areas I'm an expert, but I see the opportunity for very large transformations that even mm-hmm. look like software combining with health understanding, you know, are, are huge opportunities. And then look, I do think with COVID, like a lot of these things that I said about the next great platform uh, might already be here. I think COVID does shake things up a little bit. Like our, the world mm-hmm. patterns are shifting. Remote work is going to radically shift um, the way that we just experience our communities and our working world. And we don't commute and we, live in different places and we need different services there. And I think that reorganization is going to allow for a ton of startup opportunities. Now, they don't look like mobile apps in the way that some of the old ones did, but they certainly look right. like very huge opportunities to me. Right. And I mean, I guess I'm sure you've made some angel investments before. Would you, for the right opportunity, fund a mobile app? Or do you think that like, you know, that ship has kind of sailed and there are plenty of other opportunities um, in some of the booming industries you just talked about? I mean, I would certainly f- be interested in things that that believe that they are solving a problem that people will pay for, and like right. connecting with people, like going to to fitness classes on your phone and having a great workout, like that. I would pay for. You call that a mobile app, or do you call that a fitness service? Like, I right. don't know anymore. But like, right. but like, like if you're like, hey, I'm just going to get a million users and then ten million users, and then maybe I'll run ads. I'm probably right. less likely to have the confidence in that. Right, right. And and I guess a follow up to that is you while at Greylock you funded a, a few companies, one of them you already mentioned Musically, yeah. which became TikTok and you mentioned that they were a team out of Shanghai which didn't seem probably doesn't seem that significant at that time. Yeah. Um my uncle is from Toronto, lived has lived in Shanghai for the past 15 years and now, as it is TikTok and ByteDance, you know, there's like this whole debate of whether it's spyware, whether yeah. it's the Chinese Communist Party is spying on American citizens. As an investor in Musical.ly and someone who I'm presumably has met the, the founder of Musical.ly, I'm guessing, what are your thoughts on the whole TikTok debate as it pertains to national security and just the future of the app? I am not an expert in geopolitics by any means. Um, yeah, what I'll tell you is when I met the company, they could have been in the tip of South America. Like they right. felt like a Silicon Valley company and they had creative ideas and they were building a product that brought a lot of people joy. And I yeah. did the investment completely remotely and, and I, with the founders. I had met one person who was here, but I met the founders and interact with them completely remotely. And I think that that's powerful. And I think it truly can come from anywhere. And that's the power mm-hmm. of what we have right now. The China-US stuff specifically is incredibly complicated 
There's so many reasons that go way beyond this one company as just an example right now. Yeah. I think that their intentions of bringing creativity and joy to the world are very strong. And I think they're doing it in a, in a really meaningful way. And man, I love the product. Yeah, it's a really uh, sticky product for sure. A few more questions here. One of the one biggest investments you made uh, while at Greylock was into House Party, yeah. which is like, you know, serving a major purpose right now in the pandemic. Although unfortunately, it got acquired a little bit before this. What what are your thoughts on that? That was like, you know, a series of pivots and, and Meerkat, etc. And what do you think when you reflect on kind of that whole journey? When I first invested, like I met Ben Rubin even years before Meerkat, and he pitched the future that we would actually be broadcasting online live and that it would work and that he wanted to build the products that brought that to the world. When Meerkat first popped, I got so excited. I was very fortunate to be able to lead the investment and partner with him and saying, this is the moment that live video, 2015, bandwidth is here, phones are here, live video can work. This is wonderful. And I was so excited to partner with Ben. Six months later, Facebook had launched live. Twitter was competing with its own live products. Right. It became clear that Meerkat was not going to succeed. And Seema Sistani, who we brought on to help build Meerkat, really helped Ben co-found House Party and build this new mm -hmm. product that brought people together in a much more private, intimate way to go from what he called Meerkat was the theater. He said, this is the living room. And, and right. it was, again, incredible to go on the, the journey. But this also colors some of the things I've said before. We struggled to build enough audience. We struggled to find great monetization. You know, things were good, but they weren't looking great. And, you know, except mm -hmm. for COVID, things were fairly like flat and not particularly growing quickly. And when the opportunity came for, for Epic to be interested in the company, it was a no brainer for the company to see a second life through Epic and everything that they had been doing with Fortnite and entertainment and connecting people. And we thought there was gonna be so much synergy mm -hmm. And that it, that it was a, a really good acquisition for the team and the company. You know, fast forward to COVID, everybody needs a way to connect and be recreate the living room. And House Party, fortunately, is there and has delivered that joy to so many people. But it was one of those things that, like, I don't look at it as a massively successful investment because it didn't produce gargantuan returns for our investors. But as a person who got to join the journey and help Ben and SEMA, and SEMA really took it over and is still leading it with an Epic, I'm so thrilled for them that they've built something that that's continues to be valuable. Awesome. And uh, a few more questions here. You've stepped back from Greylock, you step back from your day to day, you're sit on the boards of Discord Medium and Mammoth Media, which creates a bunch of apps in the mobile store that are doing quite well. How do you spend your time these days? What opportunities excite you? And, and where do you see yourself in the coming years? That's a great question. You know, right now, you know, COVID has certainly derailed my plans. Uh, we were going to be traveling as a, a family for a whole bunch of this year. So I've really been just like committing myself to taking a break, to really just kind of like letting the brain and, and energy really relax. I've been doing this for 23 years. You know, I don't feel old by any means, but I certainly feel older than I was, you know, back when I was like, you know, your age, or probably many of your listeners, yeah. really just getting started on your career and, and trying to figure things out. And I feel very fortunate to have had this great journey so far. I'm still thinking about what I want to do next. Part of me wants to go work at some of these big platforms and, and help people really scale these things that now deliver so much value for the world. How much do we make them better? How do we curb some of the, the not as great things that are going on and continue to make technology better in our lives? Some mm -hmm. of me says, maybe I'll go back to investing and back the, the next new things after what's been happening with COVID. But I've sort of committed myself to you know, the end of this year. And in the meantime, I'm still on a couple boards and I'm helping out other companies and other people that I've gotten to know along the way and along my journey in ways that, you know, both keep me learning and experiencing new things and also ways that I can sort of contribute. Yeah. I mean, I think I already know this answer, but would you ever start something like you've been around entrepreneurs basically your entire career? Do you ever have inklings or a desire to, to, I'm sure you can find funding. You know, what's funny is finding funding is the least part of the, the exercise. Yeah. Like me, for other people, it's, a, it's, a, it's mm -hmm. I've been a joiner. I have loved being entrepreneurial as a joiner. I joined mm -hmm. as an early employee in many places of things I thought could be a lot bigger in the world. I got to join things as an investor with capital, but I love that, that entrepreneurial journey. The, the entrepreneurial journey does not need to just be founding. And, I'm not oh, sure. For sure. I, I'm not sure that I have the the personal commitment or readiness to be a great entrepreneur and do 
everything that it takes and sort of that amount of emotional energy. I've just never quite found it in myself to be quite ready to do that. And maybe someday I will, but I certainly have not up to, up to where I'm at now. But I have always loved being a, a great serial joiner. And I'm happy with that. And I think like we celebrate the founders so much, but I'll tell you for every great founder, there are the first hundred people that join them. And then the next 900 people that join them. And then the next 10,000 that join them to make that stuff great, that all matter too. And I've been very happy to be in that, that early circle multiple times. And I love that. Yeah. Yeah. Josh, I really appreciate you taking the time to come on the program. Great to get to talk to you. Uh, Campbell, this was great. And uh, if you have any follow-up questions, just let me know. That's Josh Elman, one of the ones who succeed. Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed this show, it would be amazing if you could leave us a review on Apple Podcasts. It really helps us out. Or why not tell a friend? That also helps new listeners discover the show. I really appreciate it. If you want to see clips from the show and stay up to date with what I'm working on, you can follow me on Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok at Campbell J. Barron. And my YouTube channel is my name, Campbell Barron. You've made it to the end of the show. Thanks for listening. I'm your host, Campbell Barron, and I'll be back in no time.